thank you uh, all for coming out. Uh, I am uh, Dr. Thomas Rashad Easley, Assistant Dean of Community and Inclusion here in the Yale School of Forestry. I uh, am very thankful that you all have come out here again for another one of our Black History Month uh, celebrations and then also lectures. So you're going to be learning some new great things always. And we're pr proud to promote brilliance within this community, but our community touches all communities. So as we say, it's not just black history, this is world history. And so we thank you all for being here. And we're very thankful for our guest. And also want to acknowledge the next person who's actually going to introduce Dr. Moore is our very own Dr. Oswald Smith. Now, the reason that I also want to say this is because Doc has a very uh, special relationship with Dr. Moore, but also to show you that our faculty also want to come out and to support different events that we have, okay, especially as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I thank Dr. Smith for being here today. Thank you, Oz. And I'd like to call up Dr. Oz Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, my pleasure to introduce the speaker today. Um, a special person, as, as, as Thomas said, um, Alex uh, completed her PhD in the Schmitz lab um, on restoration ecology. And it's, it's an interesting sort of history of how she came about um, interested in that. Um, Alex grew up in, in inner city Detroit. Um, in, an, in an environment where you had a lot of brown fields um, and unlike a lot of us who had different um, backgrounds where we would run around in the woods and, and study nature, Alex went around in the brown fields and studied nature and saw all sorts of inspiration for life trying to eke out a living in, in those, uh, those areas. But she also understood and appreciated that those areas could be rehabilitated and, and transformed uh, to have nature in built environments and nature be part of built environments. And I, that, was, that was the motivation um, to do research on, on restoration um, and, and turn it into a lifelong passion to do that. It's fitting to honor Alex um, today. Um, I think in, in terms of the school, uh, they are a, a pioneer in the school um, in the sense that uh, as, as a person of color, uh, they were one of the few people in the school at the time in our doctoral program. Um, and I, I, I also watched her struggle and heard her stories about being somebody who is um, very underrepresented in a student body and, and, and sort of the social and, and cultural struggles that they, they had to endure that us with, with different privileges um, don't have to endure as much. And sometimes it was heartrending to see her. And, and Alex is a very private person, so I'm not going to get into any big details, but um, what, what impressed me is Alex didn't, didn't wallow in it. What she did was say, I'm going to do something very different and I'm going to reach out and be a mentor for other um, underrepresented uh, individuals in the community. So she, she actually devoted time to be a mentor and a, and a role model for undergraduate students and, and try and inspire them to go into uh, science and as well teaching courses and, and doing field trips with, with New Haven um, uh, public school kids. So she really did commit and, and, and assume a role model um, to inspire other underrepresented um, groups to become part of the science um, as, as part of their careers. Alex has gone on now to do great science communication. She's an amazing science communicator, um, can really relate to, to the broader public in ways that we all struggle to. I don't know how she just, she just has a knack for it. It's an amazing knack to do this. Um, and, and in many respects has taken on a role in New York City also as a mentor um, to try and inspire inner city kids to pursue science as a career. Now, the thing that we also often do is we admire role models um, and we think they have it all together and everything, but we also have to remember being a role model continues to be a lonely a lonely, persevering job, and we often have to, have to also think about asking the role model, are they doing okay, rather than always trying to have the role model make everybody else feel okay. And I sometimes think maybe she also needs to hear from us that we, we really deeply appreciate what you're doing and admire um, the path you've taken um, to, to, to become the, the professional that you are. So with that, um, Alex, we'd love to hear what you have to tell us. Thank you.
Okay, so that's a lot to follow. Um, so this will probably be the first talk I bomb, and so congratulations to you all for watching. Um, and so yeah, so I guess I want to start by thanking you all for being here. Thank you, Oz, for the introduction, um, and also thank you for the invitation to come out and speak. Uh, it's actually not often that I'm asked to give a science talk while also explicitly acknowledging that I am a black person, and so being able to do this in this space actually means quite a bit to me. Um, and so actually, as I start, I do want to reintroduce myself because I feel like it will be important for how I frame the rest of this talk. And so to do that, so my name's Alex. I am a research scientist at the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, specifically, I work in their Center for Biodiversity and Conservation. And so there, I do research looking at how predator-prey interactions influence ecosystem functioning in coastal wetlands. And I'll talk a bit more about that throughout this talk. <clears throat> Uh, but in addition to this, I am also queer. So it's a photo of me and my partner. I am a black person. You can see that pretty clearly. Uh, and I grew up, as Oz mentioned, uh, in a lower middle class household uh, in Michigan. So I sp split my time between both Ann Arbor and Detroit, where my family is from. Um, and so when I think about these talks, and up until recently, I have actually spent most of my life the way that those last two slides described. So. Uh, research scientists in professional space, a queer person of color in personal spaces, but always sort of separate. Um, living sort of these two different lives was always very uncomfortable for me. And so I think that through my time here at Yale and sort of entering into my current position, I've actually been really clear about saying I'm always going to be all versions of myself in every space that I enter because I feel like on the one hand, it influences who I am, sort of how I view the world. It also impacts my work. And I feel like we have to acknowledge who we are as people and how we engage with other people in what we're doing. Um, and so that's all I'll say for now. But so as I go through this talk, the first part will really be about work that I've done uh, living sort of these dual lives. So the first part will be the work I did as a PhD student, really focusing on being a research scientist. And then the second part of this talk will really be about the work I do now and in incorporating like my whole self into that work. And so that's sort of the pathway that we're going to be taking. Um, OK. And so, one more thing, sorry. The way I typically like to start these talks is really to set the stage. And so I currently live in New York City, so it makes sense for me to set New York City as the stage. And so I'm sorry if that offends you, but just you'll get over it. Um, and so that's what I'll do. <clears throat> so this is a photo of modern day New York. So this is clearly a very urban, a very built landscape. Um, there's lots of humans here. There's lots of development, coastal development. Um, it's a very human driven landscape, all right? And so what I want you to do is just sort of keep this image in your mind as I show you this next image. Uh, and so what you're looking at here is a representation of what New York would have looked like in roughly 1600. Um, and so these are clearly very different landscapes, right? There's different values associated with them. They function very differently. And sort of transitioning a landscape that looked like this into one that looks like current New York City has a ton of implications. Um, and so we often consider one of these to be exclusively a human landscape and the other to be exclusively sort of a natural landscape. And so that means that we value these different spaces in lots of different ways. Um, and I'll actually come back to this later, but I wanted to set this up as sort of our framework for keeping these two different kinds of spaces in mind and the way that we think about them. All right. So I mentioned earlier, I am uh, someone who works in wetlands. And so what I'm showing you here is a, a map of the global distribution of wetlands, where green represents the wetlands themselves, um, and blue represents inland bodies of water, so lakes and rivers. Um, so as you can see, wetlands can be found on nearly every continent on the planet. Um, but they actually are quite difficult to delineate in terms of what their definition is and their physical boundaries. Um, the simplest definition of a wetland is actually land that is wet. Right? Um, this doesn't really narrow down that focus. If, like, if someone says, I work in a wetland, that really could mean anything. And so what I do is I um, explicitly work in a smaller subset of wetlands, and I work in coastal wetlands. So this is a photo, um, or several photos, where you can group coastal wetlands into these three broad categories. Uh, the first on the top left is uh, mangrove forests, and so these are typically found in more tropical regions of the world. Uh, marshes, so on the bottom left-hand side, these are typically found in more temperate regions, so there's lots of marshes in like New Haven and in the surrounding area. And then there's also seagrass beds, so this bigger photo here. Um, and so this is submerged vegetation that's found typically off the coast of, of tropical regions as well. OK, so now that we all know what wetlands are, or at least coastal wetlands, you then also have this other question. Why do we care? Why should anyone care? Why am I up here? Why do I do what I do? 
Um, and so when I think about value systems, it's really easy to try to group them into sort of two things. Um, one is in terms of like, what does it do? What does a thing do for me? And so if you're a person who cares about sort of services rendered, <clears throat> this is a non-comprehensive table that shows you a number of different uh, features and functions that wetlands provide. So they do a ton of stuff. Most of these things they do without you even realizing they do them, but you are directly impacted by a lot of these features and functions. Um, and so if you care about sort of what am I getting out of this thing, this list might convince you to care about wetlands. Uh, if you happen to be a bit more money driven, I will not judge you for that, um, but there are also values that can be added to wetlands related to cost. And so a paper came out in the late 90s, was updated again in 2014, where a bunch of researchers went out and did an evaluation of ecosystems in terms of the dollar value of services that they provide to human beings. And so what they found is that wetlands, as you can see here, provide functions and services valued in trillions of dollars annually. And so what this means, if you think about that map I showed you where all the wetlands are across the world, if you delete all of those wetlands, it would then cost humans trillions of dollars every single year to provide the same functions and services that wetlands provide just by the fact that they exist. And so if you happen to care about things based on how much it costs you or saves you, you might be concerned about wetlands for, for this reason. Uh, and so what we can see here is that wetlands are super important. Um, but as human beings, I think we know that just because we know something is important doesn't really mean we take care of it. So we happen to know that since roughly the 18th century, the world has lost about 50% of its wetlands. So they're, they're all gone. Um, and humans are the main drivers of these losses. So we do a ton of things as people. We do a ton of, ton of awful, awful things. Um, but we're gonna, I'm gonna group the sort of three main drivers of wetland loss uh, are shown here. The first is land conversion. So taking something that used to be a wetland and turning it into something else like urban development or agriculture. Um, another one on the top is uh, climate change and the associated sea level rise. And so wetlands, coastal wetlands in particular, are a really interesting ecosystem in that most of the time they can sort of balance the height of the land with the height of the sea. So it's through a process called accretion. Um, because of sea level rise, uh, the human component of sea level rise, that's happening far too quickly. And so wetlands are not able to keep up with that. So these are landscapes that are then drowning over time because they can't keep up with the level of water. Um, and then the third one on this bottom photo is uh, we're losing wetlands because we're losing consumers that are existing in these spaces. And so this is actually where I come in, in terms of like what my work is and why are we all here today. Um, I focus on the loss of consumers and how that can lead to the loss of an entire ecosystem. And so I want to explain this last point because I feel like it's really important. Um, and so I think it's already been mentioned, I work in a museum, which means that I work with lots of age ranges of both students and adults. And it has actually been really useful for me to find like a unifying theme to make this easy to describe to people. Um, it turns out that the Lion King is a unifying theme. Um, so I'm gonna use that to describe to you how you can lose a species and then lose an entire ecosystem. Okay, so to do this, we're gonna build an ecosystem. I'm also gonna drink some water. Okay, so in our ecosystem, we've just got our, our first trophic level, so just vegetation. We're gonna add in a uh, gazelle, all right? So these are gazelle, we're deciding, and this is the herbivore in our system. So they eat the vegetation, we're all doing great so far. And then at the top here, we've got uh, Simba and Nala, or Beyonce, depending on your preference. Um, and that's our sort of top predator in the system, right? So we've got a very simple, oh right, and Pride Rock, because where we are matters. Um, so yeah, so this is our simplified food web, our, our simplified structure. And so you can imagine a scenario where Simba and Beyonce are gone. Um, and so in this scenario, we then expect their prey to increase in size, right? We no longer have predators here, so now we're able to reproduce and, and have lots of individuals present. Um, the expectation then is that what they consume should be less, right? This is all pretty intuitive. So now we've got less vegetation in the system. So there are situations in which this consumption can go to the point where we lose all of the vegetation in the system. So that looks like this. And uh, it can get to the point where it's also very difficult for that vegetation to grow back even when herbivory is, is gone. And so what tends to happen here is these guys leave to find literal greener pastures, right? Food somewhere else. And then Pride Rock dies. Um, and then that's sort of the end of the Lion King, right? And so this is a very dramatic representation of how this can happen. Um, but this is sort of the, the way in which you can lose a certain species in a system and then also lose everything else um, in that same system. 
And so there are pieces of evidence that indicate that this does happen in wetlands. And so this is uh, imagery from a paper that came out a little while ago. And so this photo is um, showing you plots where predators are still able to have access to this space. And so that means that they are controlling their prey, so they're not eating too much of the vegetation, versus this, which is a plot that shows um, a cage that limits predator access. So their herbivorous prey are still present, able to consume all of the vegetation. Um, and this can lead to lots of really significant losses over the course of an entire uh, ecosystem. So what we know right now is that wetlands are important and that we are losing them. And so what we have done as people is we go out and we try to find ways to help recover um, these systems over time. So the idea is to do restoration. And what we do is we, we take something that looks like this. So this is a, an unhealthy degraded wetland system. Um, we do some science, prayer, magic, and hopefully get it to look more like this, right? So this is, a, at least visually, a more healthy functioning ecosystem. And so usually, well, how do I want to say this? Restoration typically involves a ton of different steps, and all of those steps will be really dependent on what the problem is, where the problem occurred, and all the needs of that system. But most uh, restoration efforts typically include at least these three steps. Uh, the first is to remove the disturbance. So whatever was causing the problem, you want to get rid of that first, because anything else you do doesn't make any sense without uh, fixing this first issue. Next is to rehabilitate the soil and then improve the hydrology. So this is really fancy speak for saying we want to make sure our soil is healthy, make sure the water is sort of moving and flowing functionally through the system. And then the last step is to then restore the vegetation. Um, and so the idea here is this uh, sense of if we build it, they will come, right? If we build a new apartment building in New York City, people will move into that apartment building. If we build this habitat for species, species will return to these spaces and then function will also return over time. Um, so we do all this work, and so then we have to ask the question, how well do, does that do in terms of recovering a lot of the losses that we've experienced? And so what I'm showing you here is a paper that's a little older now, but the results still hold, um, where we're looking at a comparison of how restored wetlands function compared to a natural wetland that hasn't been altered or, or hasn't been damaged. Uh, and so I'll just walk you through this image quickly. And here we will see if this works. Great. Okay. Um, so along the x-axis, we're really just looking at time since restoration, so zero up to 100 years. And then up here, this dashed line with the zero mark, this represents a natural reference wetland that we're comparing it to. And so they're looking at three different kinds of metrics in the study. The first one is hydrology, so how well is the water um, being situated in that system. That actually recovers quite quickly in, a, in an effort, so we're going to ignore that for now. Um, but then these last two points really matter a lot. So the green line here is biological structure. So think of uh, d diversity in that system, food web structure. Um, and then the yellow line is biogeochemical processes. So think decomposition, mineralization, other larger features. Um, and what you can see is that across all of the studies, on average, restored wetlands typically function less well compared to their natural counterparts. So we do have this gap, which is the difference is roughly 33% um, between a restored wetland and a natural wetland. So there are a number of potential explanations for this. Um, many of them are written on this slide. So it includes the size of the wetland, what's the environmental context, climate, other, other different features that might be a big part of that. Um, what you don't see listed here, and what you don't really hear about too often, is whether the way we do restoration in the first place might be the reason we're not getting the kind of recovery that we're looking for. So as a reminder, uh, so this is the image of all of the three steps that are typically involved. Um, and what you can see here is that we're really focusing here on, on restoring the physical components of the environment, right? So we're making sure the soil is great, make sure the water is cool, making sure the trees and the vegetation, all that is sort of a built part of the system. And these are physical, more abiotic, right? We're not really concerned about the living components of the system when we're putting together this habitat. Um, but we know from a number of other different kinds of studies that consumers and the interactions between different species actually do a lot in terms of impacting the function of an ecosystem. And so these are just a handful of examples of consumers that we know in their presence or their absence really drive function and can drive health in their ecosystems. Um, and so there's reason to believe that this might also be true in wetlands, right? It might also be true that consumers play a pretty big role. Um, and historically, people have thought that they don't. So the, the historical notion is that in wetlands, these bottom-up features, so these non-living parts and these physical components are way more important than consumers. Um, but more recent studies have shown that that's not necessarily true. 
And so this is just an example of a handful of papers that show that consumers ranging from snails and crabs all the way up to waterfowl and livestock, um, they do drive certain features in wetlands. And specifically here, they're all looking at the way that consumers impact vegetation growth and structure over the course of the, uh, over the extent of the wetland. Um, but this actually doesn't really get at other things, right? So wetlands and ecosystems in general do more than just grow vegetation, right? There are lots of other biogeochemical processes and features happening within these systems that consumers might also be driving. And we don't really have the answer to how consumers might be impacting these larger features, um, which means that we're missing pieces of information that might help us do a better job at recovering and understanding how these systems work. Okay. So that's a really long preamble that I always think is really important before getting into like what I do. Uh, and so given that we have this gap, right, this understanding, this lack of understanding of how consumers might be impacting certain broader ecosystem functions, that's sort of where I've come in with the questions that I ask. And so the first two questions that we'll get into here are about work that I did while a PhD student at Yale. Um, that's all I'll say about that for now. Um, and so the first question here is how do consumers influence the restoration of ecosystem functions in coastal wetlands? And so this is specifically in research sites that I've chosen here, gone out and done that work and have that data. The second question, what's the impact of consumers on ecosystem functions overall is a broader question. So do we have data across all wetlands across the world where people are looking at these differences between consumer presence, consumer absence, and how that might influence function in these systems? Okay, so I'll go over this first question first after more water. Okay, so the first question, um, how do consumers influence the function and the restoration of function over time in coastal wetlands? And to get at that, I worked in New England salt marshes, right, New Havens in New England, and it was less scary to me to work locally than to work internationally, so this is what we did. Um, and so just for some context, so these are highly productive systems. So over a growing period, over a season, they have a lot of vegetation growth over time. They are experiencing rapid losses due to human activities, and because we know that they're really important, a lot of restoration takes place uh, in coastal uh, salt marshes. And as I just noted, a lot of recent research has shown that consumers might play a big role in sort of the, the level of functioning that we exhibit or that we see. And so in terms of the study system that I worked with, these are the main players. So the smooth cordgrass is the dominant vegetation in the system. There are several species of fiddler crab, and so they are burrowing detritivore, so they eat organic matter. Um, the purple marsh crab is the burrowing herbivore, so this is consuming vegetation both above and below ground. And then the European green crab here is the carnivore, eating those two. Um, and so this is the, the network that I worked with. This is the most influential uh, consumer species found in salt marshes in the region, so it made the most sense to work with these. And so to get at this question that I have of how important are consumers in driving certain features, and then also how important are the interactions between consumers for driving certain features, I did a manipulation experiment, and it looked ex exactly like this, um, where I had three treatments. So an open control was really just, I didn't do anything, just measuring certain features to get a sense of the baseline conditions at these sites. Uh, and then two manipulation treatments. One, predator exclusion. So this is one where the detritivore and the herbivore could still move freely through these cages, but the predator had no access. And then a predator inclusion. And so this is one, again, detritivore and herbivore could move freely through these cages, but I confined the predator within it because I'm cruel. Um, and so this was done at three different field sites. Uh, along the Connecticut coastline, and then this ran over a two-year period. So the idea is to, to get a sense of how, over a longer time span, how I, might we be seeing certain consumer impacts change different features. And then in terms of what was measured, these are some of the features that I was taking uh, a look at. So looking at organic matter content in the soil, looking at above-ground biomass, and then different metrics uh, of nitrogen in the soil. Um, and so what I'm going to do, because I don't really like to have super data heavy talks, I've got two slides that are going to show a couple figures. The first one is going to be a figure uh, that combines the data from all of three of those research sites that I looked at. I'm going to ask you only to care about trends, not like mechanisms or trying to like make sense of it, because I don't need you to do that right now. Um, and so that will be the first one. And then the second slide will really narrow in on one specific site to really give you a sense of what that outcome was. Okay, so this is the first slide with some data. Um, percent covers outlined because I'm having you look at it for a second, but nothing happened there, so stop looking at it. Um, the same for organic matter content, so nothing really significant happened here, so we can all stop looking at that one. Um, and then these last two, actually something interesting did happen. So there were some marginal impacts uh, of consumer presence or absence 
looking at nitrogen in the soil and looking at above ground biomass. Um, these are marginal when all of the sites are put together, but it turned out these are pretty strong in one specific, foot, in one specific site. So I'm just gonna highlight that one and then show that outcome. So at one of the sites, um, for both nitrogen and uh, above ground biomass, there's an interesting trend where you see, I can do it here. So for example, it's stronger in the nitrogen, so I'm gonna show you the nitrogen, but it's, it's marginal in above ground biomass, um, where we've got these control conditions. So this is the uh, level of nitrogen absorption happening uh, just at baseline at the site. We remove the predator, and so we can see a significant shift here in terms of the absence of the predator, and then when we add the predator back, we get the recovery of those features, right? Um, and so this is really interesting. It's really exciting to me to, to see how over a growing season in a particular location, removing a consumer can do one thing, putting it back can return it to what it was. And that means a lot. And so something similar happened with above ground biomass, but it's not as pretty to look at. So I don't feel the need to go over that in this moment. But so what this means overall is a couple things, right? So experimental treatments impacted not only biomass, but also this other soil feature, which is already new information, because we normally only see consumers impact um, vegetation within these systems. That's the expectation. So that's fun. Um, the next thing is that consumer impacts are context dependent, which means that we didn't see the same thing across every site. We saw something very specific happening at one specific location. And so this is actually consistent with a paper that's already out that indicates in these same sites, different measured variables were altered very differently in separate locations. So there's a lot of context dependency happening here. Uh, and it also indicates that it could be important to consider consumers and restoration, right? If we're thinking about the ways in which we're trying to recover certain features, we're seeing that these consumers do have some kind of impact on those features, so we might want to be incorporating them in the work that we're doing. Okay, so that's that first question. So we're going to transition ever so slightly. I do this thing where I like take a water every time I ask a question. Sorry. So. Okay, and so for the second question, we're looking at um, still this question of how consumers are impacting function, but not only at specific sites, now we're just sort of like across all different studies that have evaluated these two things, what were the outcomes? And so to get at that, I did everyone's favorite thing, which was a literature review. Uh, and so to do this, I basically was compiling as many papers as I could that looked at consumer presence or absence, the impact on certain ecosystem properties in coastal wetlands. Um, and so we ended up with roughly 1,500 papers that came out of just this very initial queue or query. And then after sifting through all of them, only like 45 were useful. Um, so that was great. And so of those papers, uh, this is a list of the variables that were, that were used in evaluating presence and absence impact. Um, and so the next slide, I'm actually going to show you just a subset of a table of that data so that you can get a sense of some of the expectations and outcomes. And so just to orient you really quickly, um, across the top are just the different features, right? So on the, the far left, just just the authors, the year of the study, and then consumer type. And then the rest of these are just different variables that were measured in the presence or absence of the consumer. Um, this can be overwhelming, so I'm actually only going to highlight a couple different parts of this. First is this consumer column. So we can see here that most of these studies are looking at livestock or looking at snails and crabs or other invertebrates. So that's just like one thing to remember for a second. Next is uh, I'm highlighting organic matter and how this was measured in several different studies in the presence and absence of the consumer. And these are evaluated using, shown here, three different measurements. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And then lastly, just like look at the whole table. It's like empty. And that is informative in a lot of ways, but it also means that it's difficult to do quantitative analyses. And so I'm not gonna show you any of those, but what I will show you are just conclusions based on these features that I just highlighted. So what I'm calling this is sort of the data gap. And so there are four really clear takeaways from this literature review. The first is that, um, I didn't show it in the previous slide, but salt marshes heavily outweighed uh, the number of studies that were done on salt marshes were significantly larger than the number of studies done in either mangroves or seagrass beds. So we're seeing a large habitat bias in, in the work being done and asking this question. Next is metrics. So as you can see, I point out organic matter that was measured in three different ways. Across all of the studies, there were too many metrics. There was very little consistency across studies and very little overlap. So that made it difficult to combine things together to see if there were generalizable trends because everything was, too, was done in such different ways. 
Next is consumer diversity. So the focus was very heavily on invertebrates and livestock. And this makes sense given that the focus is very heavily on salt marshes, right? So invertebrates are pretty common in salt marshes. They're really easy to manipulate. And livestock are commonly used as grazers in them. So there's, it's really easy to tell an area that has been grazed, an area that hasn't been grazed, and then do a study based off of that. Um, but what this means is that we're missing out on the number of other uh, consumer species that do exist in all of the different variety of these coastal marshes and wetlands that are not being evaluated. And then the last point here is that all of the papers that were incorporated into this had no trophic interactions and we're only looking at consumer presence and absence. Um, we're not really evaluating community structure or non-consumptive effects that might be happening in the presence of a predator that's not consuming the prey. And so what this means, at least to me, is that if our goal as people who are practicing restoration is to go from something that looks like that image on the left to something that looks like this image on the right, we kind of can't expect to be good at doing that if we don't even really understand how these systems function in the first place. We don't know the roles that all of these different features are playing, so of course we're not getting the kind of recovery that we were hoping for. Okay, so we're going to shift gears now, ever so slightly. I don't like segue well, so we're just, we're shifting gears. Um, so what I have talked about so far has really been a focus on one kind of gap, right? The sort of ecological data gap that we have that limits our ability to do restoration or conservation very well. Um, what we also have is a gap in sort of our understanding and acceptance of sort of the differences between people and the people who are impacted by conservation choices that are being made. Um, and so because of this, we typically practice conservation with a focus on what we are trying to conserve, right? Very exclusively on the thing that it is we are trying to protect without realizing that it is sort of enmeshed in a system of people who are also a big part of that system and how that system works. And normally, I don't want to say normally, in a lot of ways we, we tend to do conservation in two ways that are partially successful but also very problematic. Um, one of them is through the, a practice called fortress conservation, right, where we take a space that is green and natural and we decide that it's important and then we also decide no one can use it, right? We decide that it can't be touched and that's a problem because people often depend on these spaces for their livelihoods, for their culture, for their traditions um, and that in itself is a problem, right? The other thing that we can do, or that is often done, is through the militarization of conservation. Right? So we decide that a species is really important, a space is really important, so we arm people to protect it, which can also cause a lot of local conflict. And so we're focusing so heavily on doing the science and forgetting the impact that it has on the people and the places where it is being done. And so there is literature out there that sort of discuss this at length. And so we know that typically when we think about conservation practice and the choices that are being made, um, they are focused heavily on primary literature, uh, gray literature, and sort of like empirical evidence, information, science, research. It turns out that it is actually better in terms of having equitable and sustainable outcomes to be doing work that still incorporates primary literature, expert influence, uh, but also keeping in mind local perspectives, expert knowledge, people's value systems. Those should be equally incorporated into all of these different choices because they, they all matter together, they all influence each other together. Um, and so that sort of carries me into what I do now. So this was sort of a long history of my life in research form. Um, and so what I do is incorporate both this empirical scientific perspective with my understanding that people also matter in these spaces and I combine that together. And I do this work here in American Samoa. I don't have a question here, but I am gonna drink a water now. So. Okay, and so for context, this is American Samoa. Um, it is a small cluster of islands found in the South Pacific, so it's between Hawaii and New Zealand. It's like a six hour flight from Honolulu. Um, I'm showing the main island here of Tutuila. It's a pretty small space. So this is a roughly 50 square mile uh, area and about 60,000 people live here. And so it's like very much an island and it moves at an island pace in every sense of the way. Uh, and so the red line that you see here sort of traversing the entire landscape, this is the one main road. It's got two lanes, one direction, one lane, the opposite direction, the other lane. It's got a maximum speed limit of 25 miles an hour, island-wide. Um, 
So everything happens here in a very specific kind of way, and you have to have patience. Um, this is a part of what this landscape can look like. Um, so it is largely, not shown here, but it's largely developed along the coastline with interior forest that is mostly untouched. Um, so what I want to do now is explain to you the work that I'm doing in this area in terms of addressing those two gaps, right? The sort of ecological knowledge gap, but then also the gap that we have between like people and understanding what matters to them in the work that we do. So uh, as I mentioned, American Samoa, uh, the coastline is largely developed, uh, but there are three regions of sort of contiguous mangrove forest uh, along the coast on the island. Um, and so to most people, these mangrove patches are actually considered barriers to development. They would much rather be able to build homes or build new businesses in these spaces. Uh, but it turns out that recent events have started to change people's ideas about the value of these systems. Um, so American Samoa gets lots of tsunamis. Uh, they, when you drive around the road, they have like tsunami like hazard areas. So you're just always aware of that. And then in 2009, there was a tsunami that hit the northern part of the island pretty, pretty badly. Uh, and research came out after the fact and were like able to identify that the mangrove forests that were in that area were able to mitigate a lot of the impact that would have otherwise happened had those mangroves not been present. Um, the island is also experiencing a lot of subsidence, so it's sinking. And so having this green infrastructure along these coastlines is actually doing a lot to stabilize that. And so local communities are becoming more aware of the value of those systems in ways that they weren't maybe aware of previously. Uh, and I mentioned before, a lot of this research in terms of how uh, the different features that might impact the health of the system have focused on salt marshes. And so this is me entering this space to sort of address this gap, asking the same kind of questions in uh, this mangrove system that I've already asked in these salt marsh systems to help try to uncover how this might play out in different contexts. And so just to go back to this map, there are, again, those three uh, contiguous mangrove regions. The first one is in an area called Leone, over here circled in red. Um, it's a pretty small inland uh, mangrove system, and it's already being managed by a collaboration between uh, the, government, the government and a local village. So I will not be working there. That's already taken care of. Um, there's another one in a village called Vatia. And so this is another small mangrove region. Um, you actually have to drive over the mountain to get to that one. Uh, and I tried to do this one day. The road was really steep and it was kind of wet. I got scared and just like drove back. So I haven't seen it, um, but I, I do believe that it's there. <laughs> and then there's a larger one. So near the village of Tafuna, so this is the largest mangrove system on the island in an area called the Pala Lagoon. Um, that's where I will be working. So I have a lot of really good access to these areas. Um, and the idea here is to really go out into these spaces and ask the exact same question I've already asked, just in a new place, because I don't really feel the need to come up with something novel. It just seems like ask the same question somewhere new to get more information out of that same question. And so I will be in these spaces doing, honestly, the exact same kind of field work, uh, where I'm going into these mangrove sites, I'm evaluating what happens if you have certain species present, if you have those species removed, and seeing how that impacts function. And that's all I'm doing, just asking the same question in a new way. The other part of the work that is new for me <clears throat> is incorporating the personhood component, right? In terms of myself and in terms of the people who live in these spaces. And so to provide some information on this, um, so American Samoa is a US territory. That is a mess, right? In and of itself, that is very messy. It's very complicated. Uh, it has its pros and cons. So in terms of downsides, it means that the people who live here do not have any of the sort of rights and resources that are available to people who are US citizens. Um, <clears throat> in terms of upsides, uh, there are a few of those as well. So at least 96% of the residents in American Samoa are Samoan. The rule there is that you have to be 51% Samoan by blood to own land. Um, that can sound messy, but it actually is really important to them. Right? If you think about indigenous communities being able to still own their land, it means a ton. It means a lot. Um, and so that means that me entering that space can actually be quite complicated, especially recognizing that the culture and traditions of American Samoa are typically skewed a bit socially conservative. Um, it's super important in the local communities to really focus heavily on family first, then the church, then maybe yourself, but yourself is not first in any capacity in this space. 
Um, and it is worth noting that even though the U.S. doesn't own sort of the land, they are still very involved in the management of certain parts of the landscape. Uh, so NOAA and the EPA are a pretty large presence on island. Uh, and so what this means is that when I go to American Samoa as an American, um, as a queer person of color, it means that I'm sort of doing a dance, right? I'm sort of dancing to make sure that what I'm doing is not just about myself, but also is still very much about the things that are important to people who live here. So my questions are really rooted in what are the things that are important to you and how can that be built into this shared understanding of how we can sort of work together in this space? Because it does a lot of damage to be a researcher entering a space, asking your own questions, leaving that space. And so what I'm doing is I have questions about things I want to learn from the people and things that I want to ask that are most relevant to them and be able to provide the kind of answers that they can use even after I leave. And so to do that, I work with all kinds of people on islands. So I have most notably so far worked a lot with the National Park Service. This is a, an image that represents their community college. There's one college in American Samoa. Uh, and they have lots of high schools. And so there's high school students, there's these college students and, and, and teachers, and the EPA, and honestly, just people who live here, right? They're very friendly. Like, you just show up and everyone wants to talk to you, which means I have to turn off my New York self and, like, be nice. Um, <laughs> But everyone is like very interested and very curious about what it is you're doing and like happy to share information. Um, and so that is important to me in terms of making sure as I enter the space, I am not doing it to take things away. Um, it kind of, so I think the way that I want to kind of wrap this up is by acknowledging pieces that I think are really important. Um, so I'll come to this in a second, but I went to SACNIS at the end of last year, the conference, and while I was there, a woman named, oh yeah, Danielle Lee gave a talk. Uh, and in her talk, she said something that was really impactful. Um, what she said was that a stranger can't discover something new in someone else's home, right? So I am entering this space, I will learn something myself, but people here probably already know it, right? Or know it in a very different kind of way. And so it means a lot to me to be in this space and recognizing that I am here to gain as much from it as possible and give as much to it as I can. And so I think the way I kind of want to wrap this up is by acknowledging that typically when we think about conservation, we think about spaces that look like this, right? We, we go out into these spaces, we ask these questions about how we can preserve them, and we prioritize those kinds of questions in these kinds of spaces. Um, when we think about spaces like this, we think that they're just urban centers, right? They're just for people, driven by people. And I think that there's value to both of these, and I don't think that one is more valuable than the other. Um, what I think we really should be doing is thinking about spaces as being a combination of both of these things altogether. And so this is a photo of Singapore. Singapore is a messy, messy example for a lot of social things. We won't talk about those. Um, but what I will say is in terms of using the landscape as a metaphor, we're really talking here about valuing both human needs and nature um, simultaneously. And I think that we aren't often taught to do that in our science, right? Our science is really heavily driven by like, what are we getting done? What are we learning? But we're forgetting that people are, are part of these spaces. And so even though I recognize that this adds a ton of complexity and like nuance to the work that we do, I think that we kind of, as scientists who enter these spaces, have an obligation to care about both of those things equally. Um, and so that's what I'm trying to do. And that's all I'm going to say. So the end. And I guess I'm <clears throat> supposed to take questions now. So if you've got some of those, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. I'm just pointing at you. Yeah, I don't know your name. Hi, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, you were mentioning about with the literature review, you saw you know, gaps. And uh, I'm just kind of wondering, um, if, I mean, kind of like um, how um, you would suggest like addressing those gaps, obviously just like doing research, but as far as like funding and like Ooh, yeah. getting people to like be aware of those gaps and also to get 
um, now like bringing in this human component and really like researching that human component as well and like making that a priority like yeah. to get uh, like funders and just like general people interested in those aspects as well uh, to ensure that we get you know literature on that as well yeah that's a big question I can only answer it from like my own experience of being successful in certain like spaces um, I think a lot of times if you're looking for funding, you can couch a lot of this into like your broader impacts, right? Like they give you an opportunity to talk about how those things are gonna be really important. Um, I think that what I tend to do, because I think I don't have the patience for being subtle anymore in my life, is I will apply to something that clearly has some scientific importance, like some sort of driven by um, a scientific question, and then built into that all of these other components. Like I will make it very explicit that that will be a part of what I do in this work and make it very convincing that that will make the work better and will make the outcomes more meaningful. Um, but that's just my perspective. I'm sure there are other approaches that one can take in, in doing that kind of work. Hi, thanks so much for your talk today. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to dig in you, on one of your slides. Um, you had, um, it's important to explicitly consider community structure in ecosystem restoration projects. And I just mm -hmm. was wondering if you could elaborate a little more on that, dig into the ecology a little bit. Yeah, so Thank you. I don't know if this is the one that you're talking about. Yeah, so this one for me was really thinking very explicitly about uh, how we normally do restoration. So restoration normally focuses on building these habitats and then expecting recruitment of species to come back over time and that once they you know, come back, then the function will come with them. Um, I think that what we should be doing is building these habitats and also rewilding these spaces with species that we know are functionally really important in these spaces. And so that might not only mean throwing in a bunch of herbivores, it might also mean throwing in like their predator to help moderate those interactions um, instead of waiting for time to allow them to come back on their own. Um, that's what I meant in this context. I'm not like restructuring human communities. There's one all the way in the. Thanks. Thank you. That was great. Um, if you're working with conservation with some, you know, elephants, if you're dealing with migratory species like pronghorn, you end up going over to some really large areas and trying to integrate the scale of the ecological scale required and the community scale is often difficult, um, whether it's an indigenous group, local community, whatever. And I'm wondering if you run into that as much with wetlands, and if so, how do you deal with it? Um, and thanks I mean, again for your talk. Yeah, I think that for me, at least in the work that I did here, like describing this work here, it hasn't been a problem because oftentimes people who live near these landscapes value them for recreational usage. And they are really aware of when something is different in that landscape. And so for, for this work, I went to people's houses and had to get permission to go into their backyards. And they were really curious about wanting to know what was happening back there and whether they were doing things that could help improve the conditions of the site. So I have not myself had to deal with the sort of negative relationship that can exist between nature and, and people. I think that that might present itself very differently for me in American Samoa, where people need livelihoods, right? And oftentimes people associate having space to build on as being directly correlated with being able to sort of make a living. Um, and so for me, I think it's a lot more about recognizing that that value is what drives them and has been really important for the choices that they make, while also being able to enter a space and express the ways that this other system might provide values they might not have been thinking about. Um, but that's a sort of like conflict that hasn't happened yet that I'm sort of like waiting for. So I don't have an answer for how you can mitigate that in other systems because I haven't had to deal with it quite yet myself. Thank you so much for your remarks today. I was curious about, um, you mentioned, it's more about your narrative, um, you mentioned that you, um, when you were here, you were kind of focused locally um, with uh, the local ecosystems, and now you're all the way out in American Samoa. Right. So I'm curious about how you um, got to, to that. Uh, that's a great question. I'm perpetually confused also about that. Um, honestly, very, very realistically how it happened was I was working here locally because it made a lot of sense. I wanted to sort of reduce the amount of risk associated with my work. Um, and moving into my new position, I knew that I wanted to scale up and ask questions in spaces that people don't normally ask. We ask a lot of US-centric questions, 
and we also ask questions in international spaces that seem beautiful and novel and that people have um, heard about. Uh, you don't really see people going into these smaller spaces that are less resourced and asking questions that are so impactful for those communities that live there. Uh, and so initially through the museum, my department has a relationship with Hawaii. We have sort of like satellite uh, employees. And so that was an initial connection that made a lot of sense uh, initially. Um, but mangroves in Hawaii are non-native, so it doesn't really make sense to go into that space and be like, how can we restore these things you hate here? Um, and so it made sense to then think about what are other spaces in these Pacific Islands regions that people don't really get as much attention drawn towards. Um, and so that's kind of where, how I landed there. Uh, this was initially funded to work in Malaysia, but there's just a ton of red tape regarding getting research sort of up and running in that region. And so shifting to a sort of smaller space that was gonna impact more people you know, per capita, um, I think that drove that choice for me. So it happens to be beautiful, but like I'm always afraid when I'm flying there. So it's not that great for me all the time. We're done? Cool, we're done. <laughs> Great.